Okay, welcome to week eight, lecture seven slash six completion. Uh, last week, I didn't finish the slideshow I was after, so I'm going to try to finish it this week and still get this week's slideshow done. We'll see how well this goes. Um, also, as some of you realized or went to look at for last week's recording, there was a grand total of 12 minutes recorded. And I figured out today why. So, it's not going to happen again. However, the good news is I've done these lectures enough that I could say, just go look at the lecture from 17 fall. It's exactly the same, almost. The, not the same questions asked by the students, but it's the same content. Um, but I'm going to pick up where I left off last week, which was I was talking about string functions in SQL. Now, you guys have started playing in Java. You guys know what a function is. And you may have started learning about strings in Java and what you can do with strings. Um, SQL has similar functionality. Essentially, they're very similar to most programming languages' uh, string functions. Basically, you use them to manipulate, to play with the contents of the strings. Now, here's a, for a few useful functions you may see. Lower and upper. Lower, bracket, and then you give it a string or a field name, and it'll go to lowercase. If you do upper, guess where it's going to go? It's going to go uppercase. So for database servers that don't support I like for pattern matching, as in you want to do an A case insensitive like, how would you do it? You send the entire string to lower to upper, and then you pattern match. It would look something like this. Uh, not that. This. So if I did right now, I'm not catching everybody who has an uppercase AM. But if I were to say now I'm going to catch mixed case because what is happening is I'm taking the name. I'm forcing it to lowercase, and then I can pattern match on the lowercase. So for database servers that don't have I like, this is how you do it, which is almost every other database server. There were some of them are case insensitive, Microsoft SQL Server and uh, MySQL. Some are not case, sen or case sensitive, and they do this is how you do it. Trim. Uh, trim, you should probably know from Java. If you haven't learned it yet, you'll learn it soon enough. Trim gets rid of the white space at the beginning or at the end of a, of a string. So, for example, somebody input their name and they kept the space inside of it. So they went, you know, Dan space, instead of hitting enter, they hit a space and then they hit enter. So it gets stored with the space. Trim gets rid of white space at each end. It gets rid of dead characters. Uh, it allows you to have a few extra arguments, such as leading, trailing, both. And you can even tell it, I want you to remove certain characters from the end. So you can tell it, get rid of the letter A. So nobody's name is allowed to start with A. It's a little more powerful than the trim function you find in Java. Um, substring allows you to find just a piece of the string. So it allows you to split a string. So you've got a complex string. You guys learn about string split yet? Sort of? No? Split. No. Okay. Well, Java's got a split function. The same works roughly the same thing. You tell it, take this string, split it from this character to this character. And this one's a little different. You say, start from here. And it always starts at one. And you tell it, go for this many characters instead. So, in other words, you'd split starting at one for five. It'd give you the first five letters of any given string. Position allows you to find whether or not a, sub a string exists in another string. So if you want to search for the name Dan, you can search for, sub for position of the letters Dan, and it tells you where. So if somebody's name is Aiden with D-A-N at the end, it would tell you it's at position 4. If a person's name is Daniel, it would tell you it's at position 1 when you search for Dan. So these are useful functions. Length. How long is it? It's the same as Java. The arguments are a little different. This one here is not string dot length. This one is length bracket string. 
And if you've seen basic or you've seen other older languages, you're going to be used to this function. Date functions. Just so you know, dates suck. It is the worst part of working with data ever. For example, ask an American, how do you format a date? They're going to give you month, day, year. So, for example, they'd give you 06-05-1998. Is that May 6th or April or June 5th? We don't know. In, a, in the States, it would be June 5th. In Canada and most of the rest of the world, it would be the other way around. Dates are bad because, you know, they're just hard to work with, especially when you start doing math. Date math is the worst. Today minus 14 seconds. So there's tons and tons of functions. Each database server implements them uniquely. Unfortunately, every server does it differently. However, there's two that are fairly generic. And one of these you've seen already. Now. What is now? Now. <laughs> what does it give you? Year, month, day, 24 hours, minutes, seconds, depending on the server, you know, precisions after that. They don't all give you the precision. And depending on the server, it may include a time zone or not. Depends on the server. But now tells you right now. Uh, this is actually slowly being replaced by a global constant, a magic keyword that now means the same thing called current timestamp. But not all the servers support it, but almost all the servers have now. Therefore, now works. The other one that's really handy is extract. Extract allows you to pull out a piece of time. So what's a piece of time? If I come back to my console, and I go, Right now, you'll see the order date. You got the year, month, day, and you know a time. If I wanted to go, and I mistyped that. Pretty sure there's a string. No, I got two commas now. Oh, yeah, from the goes to show I don't use this function very often. There we go. Thanks. Just, I don't remember the syntax off top of my head either. So, extract year from. What's cool is I could say, oh, shoot. I got to just ask for the month. It's cool. You can just grab the bits and pieces. Now, you'll often ask, you be asked questions. One thing I get at work on a regular basis is, what were the sales this time last year for the month of April? So instead of going and trying to match out, you know, putting a big between, I'll actually go and say, give me everything broken down by year and then by month. And I can actually give them a whole range with one query instead. They're their strings. Year and month. So I'm just pulling up that piece. Extract's really handy when you're playing with, with dates. It's a handy function. Now, something that's not in the slides, and I have to highlight this every year, is the other thing about working with dates is people don't realize the meaning of a given date. If I put up a date like this, and I say,
Date stamp means nothing. The important part is what's after, here. Pretend this is just some field, whatever. This. Now, when you search for it's equal to this, will it find that? No. Why? Well, no, it's a date. It's not a string. It looks like a string, but it's a date. No. When, okay, so this is working with a timestamp. This applies in all database servers. This is a certain amount of precision. You're asking for this. What the database server automatically does is it takes this and changes it into this. Is it the same? Because if you don't supply the time, it always sets a default value to beginning a day, which is zero. Yes? No, it does not work with dates. Even though it, you'd have to have format the date because with quote marks, because it has dashes and colons and stuff, you have to, but it's not a string, it's a date. It will actually parse it as a date. So if ever you play with a date object in, in Java, you'll know what I mean about it. When the camera det det disconnects, I lose my connection. Okay, so if you're back to this, to the date, thank God I didn't record that previous statement when I noticed my camera <laughs> kicked off. Um, when you're trying to find dates on this day, you, there's two ways of doing it. You can use extract and pull out the different pieces, or you can actually supply the whole date so that you're grabbing like that, or, or you go one day further. And you'd say, because it's set to zero, 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 the, what are the odds that there's a record being inserted at the, with, at the microsecond? Pretty much non-existent. The probability is there, but it's not likely. Or you can just say less than, and it will always grab everything up to the very start of the day, which, of course, there's no records on that record, so it'll grab everything until the end of the day. So dates are the worst part to work with because of the way they behave. So during labs, if you're having a hard time with the dates, come and see me so we can go through this individually. Okay. Yeah. Less than. My handwriting's terrible. Okay. Well, there's also numeric functions. They're similar to most functions in most programming languages. The options are some of these are the common ones. ABS, absolute value. Just like, you know, if you have a calculator and hit the ABS button, uh, AB, ABS, yeah, it'll do the same thing, absolute value. Modulus. Do you guys know what a modulus is? Okay, yeah, your tailors are taking this in math right now, aren't you? <laughs> Guess what? You can do a modulus in, in this. You can get the database server to do your modulus for you. Uh, you can round. Surprise. You can round. Floor. Yep. Um, v is what you're trying, to, the value. The S is the number, the precision. So you can say round price, and it would just round it to no decimal places. If you include comma two, it'll round it to two, comma three, it'll round it to three. It's the precision. Otherwise it rounds to the full integer. And it'll round up or down as applicable. Floor takes the number, cuts off the decimal place. So even if it's 8.9, the answer will be 8. If you do ceiling, which I'm not, I don't have listed on here, guess what? 8.9 becomes 9. 8.1 also becomes 9. It's the opposite of rounding. It, sends, it forces it all one way or the other. Random. Did you guys learn about random yet in Java? I'll give you three guesses what random does. Between zero and one. Yeah, 
the uppers. If I go like this, I go and I can keep going and the number will change. Yes. No, that's not how that works. It's times. And then you can go. Or you can go. And there's a few other tricks where you can actually do dice roll. I have an example somewhere that's a dice roll. How to calculate the dice roll. But you'll learn about random in Java. Okay, so that's the math functions. Now I gotta get to today's lecture. Yepers. And I've already I'm already half an hour in. It's a good thing I've padded the, the course. Um, no, I want to minimize this. All right. Yeah, it makes sense. I don't want to record myself twice. Okay. B, did I? Of course I did. So what am I covering this week? Well, at this point, hopefully I can get through this because I'm starting to slip. Today I'm going to talk about joins. That's actually the goal today is joins. That's what was supposed to be talked about today. Now, joins is the... I gotta be careful how I word this because I always scare people. It's the most difficult part of SQL to understand. Essentially, it's to extract data from two tables at the same time that are related. And essentially, um, when you do a join, you're gonna connect the data from one table to another table using normally the primary key and the foreign key. However, you're not limited to that, but that's normally how it's done. Um, time permitting, I'm going to talk about subqueries and set operators. No guarantees I'm going to get to those today. Now, the most commonly used join type is known as the inner join. It is the standard join. 99%, I'd say 98% of the time you do a join, is going to be an inner join. What it does, it returns records that match in both tables. There's two syntaxes. So when you go Googling online, you look up an inner join, you'll see two different syntaxes. There's the old syntax, which is from A comma B where, and then you got to match. When I learned about joins, that's the one I learned. That's what Oracle implemented 20 years ago. And if you wanted to do a left join and a right join, the syntax was strange. It involved moving an asterisk to random places inside of it. It was really unpleasant. The modern one, which has been accepted, is from A, join B, on, and then you talk about the points of commonality. Now, the other thing about the inner join is the inner keyword is optional. Because it's a, it's because PowerPoint is fantastic. <laughs> yes, sir. PowerPoint is the best thing ever. Yeah. Okay, so select name from customers. This is something you've seen. I showed you guys this last week. Now, I can go and definitely not that. And there's the countries. Let, let's just say I want to know what country a given customer is from. I need to do it. The proper way of doing this is using a join. There's a few different ways of doing it, but the proper way of doing it is a join. Now,
Okay, let me reformat that so it's easier to read. Now, select name from customers, join countries on, countries.id is equal to customers.countryid. The ID of a country in customers is equal to the primary key of countries. That's basically what the diagram shows. You guys reverse engineered the diagram. If I were to illustrate it, Really? That's the connection. When you look at a diagram, you'll see the connections, and that's why the naming, <coughs> excuse me, the naming convention is so important because it allows you to, to derive where it's coming from. Now, I'm going to run this. I'm going to get an error. I will show you guys the error. It's an important error, and it's kind of hard to read, but it says, error, column reference name is ambiguous. What does the word ambiguous mean? No, I'm talking database. I'm just talking plain English. What does ambiguous mean? Okay, I heard a bunch of blah, 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 but not actually one clear word. Somebody speak up. One per, okay, I don't know who. There you go. It's not clear. Why is it not clear? If I look at this diagram right here, I've got the name in two places. What it's telling you, it goes, dude, which name do you want? How many times have you been told as a person by your SO, what is it that you want? Be clear, right? I want to eat. What do you want to eat? Food. OK, let's be a bit more precise. Now, if I go name, and there's a few ways of doing this. I can go customers.name, and I can go and now there's my query. I'm finding each person and their matching country. And there it is. That's what the join does. That's, a, that's an inner join. Basically put, there's a one-to-one -one correlation between a customer and a country. Each country can have many customers, but each customer only belongs to one country. Therefore, the join matches up that set. That's the magic trick. I'm going to let this percolate for a second. And this is pretty standard syntax. Now, the order on the beside the on countries.id equal customers.countryid, you can flip that. It could be customers.countryid is equal to countries.id. That doesn't make a difference. However, there is a difference from top to bottom. You cannot join a table to another table that is not in the list already. For example, if I had and I apparently don't know how to type. Actually, this editor is actually kind of clever. It's telling me I'm an idiot. Um, which is one of the reasons I don't let you guys use this editor. Um, because it, it corrects your mistakes and it doesn't tell you why you're making these mistakes. The field that's currently, you can notice the countries table is highlighted a little darker on this. What's happening is you're kind of selecting for customers. You're going to join state provinces, but it's being connected to countries. But before, the countries hasn't shown up in the list yet. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to go from customers to state provinces to countries. However, you're, the way you're connecting it, countries hasn't been included yet. So you're actually telling it, guess into the future what you're supposed to connect to. If I were to take this, 
and move it here, then it's fine. Because if you're going to join one table to another table, the parent table, let's call it, has to be in the list before it. The order of joins is important. Not the order of the arguments, the order you do the joins in. If you do them, so if you're trying to join two tables and one of the tables you're trying to join to is not in the list yet, it's not going to work. It's, once you guys experiment with this, you'll trip over this a few times and you'll learn your lesson. It's, it's experience. You just learn. You join. You start at one. You work your way through the relationships down the tree. You can't jump from one branch to the other branch. So that's essentially what I was trying to do. I was trying to jump from two different branches ahead of time. So if the relationship went... Right, I was trying to join states to countries, countries to customers. This is what I was intending. However, what I did is I went Because in this case, the states, the joins only go upwards. So in other words, the bottommost one has to have something above it to connect to, on and on. So in this case, what would happen, instead of going, you know, customers, customers has countries, countries has states, we went, customers has countries, states is connected to what? Because it doesn't know about countries yet because it's been included in the list first. It's the hardest part of learning the, the whole join thing is this weird ordering that you have to deal with. And remembering that you join on keys. Um, as I said earlier, you can join on things that aren't keys. So for a join, you're not restricted to primary and foreign keys. You can join anything to anything else, as long as they're the same data type. Therefore, a common mistake I'll see is this. This is the most common mistake I see from students when they're learning how to do joins. This will work. It will run because they're both numbers. However, we're joining and we got how many? 18 rows instead of thousands. Why? Because there's 18 countries. We're joining country number one to customer number one, joining country number two to customer number two. Join cust country number three to customer number three, as opposed to, really? Where I'm connecting across the foreign keys. So that I still get my, well, right now it only returns 500 because the setter defaults 500, but it would return 10,000. All said and done. So that's the worst part of the join. You can join as many tables as you want. As I said earlier, I can join. And now I've added the states. And it's actually not very useful because the, this, this particular join, because it's basically matching every state to every country. And therefore, I'm getting multiple copies of this Amin Moulin person, just the way the join's made. Just goes to show you can't always drive one way and go the other. On the no, because these are all distinct. 
So this is another example of the order makes a difference of how you do the joins. This is a perfectly valid join. There's nothing wrong with it. The problem is it's even though the join is written properly, my logic is incorrect. So I'm joining a customer to countries and I'm telling you, okay, now I'm going to join provinces to countries with, with this regarding the customers. So each country has X number of states or provinces or political divisions. So it's going to match every country to every state they have and then give you me the matching customers. The proper way of doing the same thing would have been by flipping it all on its head. I wish it wouldn't do that. And now, because the customer also has the state problems, you can go from the customer to the state, from the state to the country. Because each state can only ever have one country, but each country can have many states. It's, it's a matter of ordering. It's magic, right? And as you saw, I got no errors. The data was totally invalid. Why is the data invalid? Is because that's literally how I asked the question. And it's unlike Java, where sometimes the logic errors are obvious, Sometimes in SQL, the logic errors aren't as obvious. And you'll run the query and you're going, why this makes no sense? Then you have to look at the logic, the order of you did things in, as opposed to the syntax. <coughs> and you have to understand the data structure below it, which that's why you have diagrams. So that's the worst part of the joins. I will actually post this on Brightspace eventually. Like that. Okay, so that's the inner join. Like I said, this is the most common join. Once you've mastered the inner join, the rest of them are gravy. It's more of a concept idea after this. Then you get the left and the right joins. Left joins and right joins do the exact same thing, except they they're the opposites of each other. And essentially, Again, the order is important because it's relative to the position in the query, just like I demonstrated. The order makes a difference. Essentially, what it does is, and I will demonstrate the easiest ways to demonstrate it. So I'm going to run this query, and it's a bunch of gnarly data that's showing up. We've got stuff from products, we've got stuff from product versions, we've got stuff from order lines. And as you can see, it's all included here for the ride. However, sometimes you will have products that aren't in use, and you'll want to find out what those products are. I honestly don't remember if I've got it set up like this in the database. Oh, I did. I'm so clever. Actually, that's probably an answer to one of the lab questions, to be honest. Um, so I did a left join. So here's the law. Let me just for reformat this a little bit so it's a little clear. So I'm selecting from products. I'm saying left join product versions. So what left join means, it says, give me everything from products plus anything you find in product versions. But if you don't find anything in product versions, give me nulls. So right now, it'll start out first with the ones it finds. So that's at the top here. If I scroll down, you'll suddenly see nulls. So left join gave me everything on this side, plus any possible matches on this side. If there's no matches, it returns nulls. Now, these kinds of queries aren't things you use on a regular basis. These are usually, you're trying to find dead records or orphaned records. 
And you can actually get a little clever with it. And you can go. And now it'll give me just the ones that are not that don't ha that don't have a matching product versions. So this query tells me as follows: select everything from products, connect via join to product versions. But I want you to do a left join. In other words, give me absolutely all products. But I'm gonna say, but by the way, just give me the ones where the product version ID is null, which tells me it's only giving me the products that don't have a match on the other side. What, well, like I said, I'll post this one also to, to Brightspace for you guys for after this lecture. And that way you'll be able to experiment with it on yours, because this I'm using the ThinkCube database. So these are all queries you guys can run. So essentially the left join will say, give me everything from products, plus any matches from product versions. And if there aren't any matches, return nulls. But what I'm telling it is, give me something where the match is null, where there's no matches. Therefore, if there's no matches, it gives you the products that aren't being sold. It's a logic thing. And once you think about it a little bit, it'll make sense. But you may need to translate to your preferred language in your head. But essentially, that's the trick for finding out orphaned records. So you want to know all the records. Then you want to know which ones are orphaned. Orphaned records are records that don't have children. It's the other way around. You know, you think about orphans, about child records without parents. These are parents without children. And this is how you'd find it. What would right join do? It would give you everything for product versions that don't have a magic in, a match in products. So I could actually take this and flip it just so I can demonstrate. And I do a right join. It should give me the exact same result, almost. All the thing that the only difference you've noticed is it moved the columns from one side to the other. And that's show you that the right join is grabbing everything from products because it's to the right of product versions. So you got the magic word left. I mean, you got the magic word join. If you see, left join, it's whatever tables to the left. If you do a right join, it's whatever tables to the right. Joins are terrible. Well, at least it wasn't coffee. Oh, and he wasn't paying attention. I made fun of him. He wasn't paying attention. Yeah. How do you recognize if the table's on the left or the right? Uh, it depends on how you type, if you, if you typed it in. Whichever order you type it in. Yeah. I almost, got, I almost gave you a sarcastic answer on that one, but it's basically you typed it in, and then you say right join. Another table is going to be the one to the, literally to the right of the word right join. Yeah. But you type it in using a keyboard. You know, so you type it in, and that's whatever order you type it in. It cares about the order. It's sort of like how when you go to assemble IKEA furniture. Anybody here assembled IKEA furniture recently? You know, sometimes you can't go to step two unless you did step one first. This is the same thing. You can't do step two unless you've done step one first. Therefore, you can't join to something unless you've already got something to join to. That's a left and a right join. Oh, I've caught up to my time. Good. I'm right where I'm supposed to be now. Now, there is one other join type, which I don't actually have in the slides. It's known as a full join. Full, like complete join. There is another word for this. It's known as a Cartesian join. Anybody here remember Cartesian math operations when you were in high school? Yeah, sucked, eh? Basically, you're joining something to everything else, everything to everything else. So for Cartesian join, the best example is a deck of cards. Right, so you have a deck of cards. 
When you do a Cartesian join, and you take table one multiplied by table two, and you end up with On and on and on and on and on. So that's a full join, also known as a Cartesian join. Um, the only time really you'll use it is if you're trying to create a matrix. That's another math word, right? Transformation matrix. Same idea. You'd use a Cartesian join or a full join to make it happen. Uh, how often do you use this in database land? I think in the last 20 years I've used it three times. That's why there's no slide for it. I make my slides based on what I've used in the recent recently, right? All right, so that's joins. It's all about syntax. Uh, lab 8 is all about joins. It starts out with easy joins and it keeps building on. So a couple of you have already started in on Lab 8. You've, you know exactly what I mean, where the first one's easy and the little, second one's a little thicker and the third one's a little thicker. It just builds up. Uh, joins are not as hard as people think they are. Once you understand the syntax and the rules of engagement, join one table, join 10 tables makes no difference. You can keep joining as many tables as you want. It makes absolutely no difference as long as you can put it in the right order. It's all about order. Which leads me to make sure my recording's still going before I continue. This is going to be an interesting bit of editing tomorrow. All right. Subqueries is my next topic. Subqueries is a query inside a query. And the problem is I used to use the movie Inception for this, but now fewer and fewer people have actually seen it. But those of you who have seen Inception will know what I'm talking about, where, you know, in the movie there's a dream inside a dream inside a dream inside a dream. Inside a dream? And he's still dreaming at the end of the movie? No spoilers? But that's argued. But subqueries is the same idea. You basically create a query and you run it inside another query. And the way it works is it runs the inner query first, takes the results, and passes out. They're known as embedded queries. That's another word for them. There's several different kinds. Um, and they're in various places. They have similar names. And they are bracketed. By bracketed, I mean they're in parentheses. Now, there's three places you can use them. Well, more than three, but these are the three common places. You can use it in the field selection list. It returns a single value from another table. This is used, often used in data transformation routines, where you don't know what the primary keys of a table are going to be. So, for example, and you can see right here, the select, and you guys have this part of the query is fairly similar, common, right? Select ID from statuses where names equal to new, and I actually got a typo in this. There should be a closing quote mark. But it, all that would return is the ID from the status where the name is new. And that should look familiar for anybody who's been working on Lab 7, because you did a select star from order statuses where name is equal to new, and it gives you one or not one, depending on how much of a hard time you had doing the lab. Now, what this is doing is it's going to actually run what's inside the parentheses first. It's going to return a value, a single value. And then it'll pull that out. That's often used for when you're building data sets from other sources. So you're importing data. You've imported all the statuses. But maybe there's already statuses in the system before. And now you've added three new ones, but you have matching data, but you don't know what the IDs are. You'd write a query similar to this to figure out the IDs on the fly. It's not used very commonly, but it is used. This is used lots. Part of the where clause. This is used, it's also known as a list generation subquery. 
most often used with the in operator. Now, this looks somewhat more complex. However, if you break it down to its component pieces, it's fairly straightforward. Select ID from product version where active is true. What is that going to give you? It'll give you all the IDs from product versions where active is true. That's plain English. So let's say you got 25 product versions, but only five are active. You don't know what the IDs are of because you shouldn't hard code, right? Therefore, this will let you pull out just the IDs of the ones that are active. Mind you, this query you could use do it using a join. Also, I'm just abusing it here for an example. And then it'll build up an in. So let me demonstrate a little bit so you have a better idea of what's happening. Oh, I actually haven't done the lab. <laughs> so here's my IDs from product versions. It built a list, right? Maybe this will... Ah, that's close enough. Okay, a list of two. I don't know what this product is. I just picked product number five for as an example. However, it's built up a list of two. Now, if I want to go... Oh, it even auto-formatted it for me. Isn't that nice? So what it's going to do is going to grab everything from order lines where the product version ID is in, but instead of saying hard coding values 1, 2, 4, it's going to say run this query first. So what it'll do is it'll run this one first, return my two values, and then it'll return all the matching all the matching order lines. So essentially what it's done is it identified So it returned those two product version IDs, right? Those are the two I'm working with. What it, and we know the in operator right, is in value comma separated list. What it'll do, it'll turn it into like that. So it takes the inner query, runs it, takes the results, basically turns it into a comma delimited list on the fly. And I'm, I'm simplifying. There's, there's more happening in the server. It's not actually creating a list. But for us to understand what it's doing is it runs the inner query, converts it into a comma delimited list, sub, and then slots it into that spot. So just like when you're doing math, how you solve the inner brackets first, take the values from that, bring it to the outer equations, same thing. It'll run what's inside the, 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 the parentheses, the brackets, take the results, turn it into a comma delimited list, and then pass it to the outer query. Now, this leads me to another statement that we have to be careful with. The further in you go, the more expensive it gets. Especially if you're using correlated subqueries. And I don't actually cover those in lecture, but they are in the booklet. And the part that talks about subqueries in the booklet, there's a complete set of examples on what correlated subqueries are. A correlated subquery, just to summarize it, is when the inner query depends on something to the outer query. They are, the two queries are talking to each other. They're, they're, there's like a, they're popping a wormhole through reality and one is sharing information to the other. Those are brutally expensive to run. As in, in the sense of, for every row you return for every row in the inner query, the outer query, it's got to run the inner query that time. So if you return one million rows, it's going to run the inner query one million times. So you're going to run one million and one queries. Subqueries are expensive. Now, when I used to use MySQL for this before we moved to Postgres, I had an example that would blue screen my laptop. It was amazing. Right in the middle of class, blue, that's before I started recording. Literally, I could run it. I said, watch this, guys. 
Boom. And then I sit there and twiddle my thumb for five minutes. And they go, what's going on? Boom, blue screen. Uh, basically put, it ran out of memory. My laptop ran out of 16 gigs of RAM. Because the query keeps diving over and over and over again. And every time it dives, it grabs a complete set of the records, puts it in memory, grabs the next set of records, puts it in memory. It just kept shoveling until it was full and it ran out of memory. S they're not that dangerous usually. I, did, I wrote a query on purpose to demonstrate how bad this could be. Uh, but on the other hand, all you have to take into account is every subquery must be run at least once, and depending on how you write it, it might run more than once. That means that, let's say I told you guys that I need you to tell me what color the sky is outside. But I'm going to say, what's the color outside? You have to go. What's the color outside? You have to go. What's the color outside? You have to go. So the subqueries run over and over and over again. Most servers are really smart. They cache the results. If the subquery doesn't change, it remembers it for the next time it's asked. So what would happen is, you go tell me what the color is outside. You come back and I ask her what the color outside is. You, she goes, Psst, you just went out, what's the color? Right, so it's a little faster because it's asking the previous query. But if I go, go, you tell me what the color outside is through that window, but I tell her to go look out that window, you've been forgotten. So she'll ask her if it's the same question as her, but if it's not, then she can't, they won't remember what yours was. It remembers the last one. Subqueries are dangerous in that way. Now, that is the most common use for it. The, the next most common use for a subquery is this one. And this is known as a derived table. This is the actually hardest subquery to wrap your brain around. Now, remember last week I talked, I didn't actually cover this, and I usually do, but I was being rushed towards the end. One of the things you can't do is you can't aggregate an aggregate. People go, what do you mean by that? Allow me to demonstrate by, ex by exploding an aggregate. Aggregate functions cannot be nested. You can't aggregate an aggregate. Let's say I want to know what the average count of orders. Totally useless query, by the way. But you know what's the average count of orders? I can't do that because you cannot aggregate an aggregate because the aggregate happens at the end of the query. So it'll take the records, count them, but it's already done its round of aggregates. So it can't go back in again and do an aggregate on it because it's already finished. It can't do it a second time. But there is a way of doing this. And it's, you use a derived table. And what a derived table is, is it's a query that's run as part of the from clause. So you, go, you know how so far I've shown you guys from orders, from customers, fairly straightforward stuff. But let's say you want to grab some data that's a little different, or you want to modify the layout. What it does is if you, you run a subquery, as part of the from clauses in, it runs first, right? The subquery runs first. It'll take the results of that and put it in memory and treat it like a virtual table, a temporary table. It never gets written to the disk. It never gets written anywhere. But it basically builds a list of values in memory. And it behaves just like a normal table, except there's none of the typical optimization things like indexes and whatnot. But it's a complete table unto itself in memory. And the most common use for it is to actually do aggregates on aggregates. Or sometimes you need to transform the underlying table structure for whatever reason. That's the other way you'd use it for. Now, if I were to go like this, All right, so, so far what I've managed to accomplish for me is the average, the count of how many orders each customer placed. I'm not getting fancy, I'm not connecting it to customers or anything like that, I'm not extracting names. It's uh, how many orders that each customer ID placed. So each customer ID 6114 placed five orders, 
you know, seven six six two placed five. I picked two that were five. Three nine three six placed three orders. That's the the one. But let's say I want to know what the average number of orders the customers place. I don't mean as in how many, what's the average I placed. Let's say I want to know, well, you placed four, you placed three, you placed five. I want to know what the average is, number of orders that customers place. Now, like I said earlier, you cannot aggregate an aggregate. However, if you create a virtual table, also known as a derived table, no, I didn't want you to do that. That's the problem with IDEs. They get really clever and they try to autocomplete for you. Now, no, I didn't forget anything. So, notice I'm running this again and it looks exactly the same. You'll see the little run icon flashing at the bottom there. Now I'm telling, grab everything from here, but it looks exactly the same. However, it's not behaving the same. What it's done, and you'll notice I put an alias as D table. You cannot have a derived table without an alias. You can call it whatever you want. You want to call it Bob? You can call it Bob. I call it D table just so it's obvious that it's a derived table. Now, the big difference though is what's happened now is this query is being placed in memory into a temporary table called D table. So it's as if I said, okay, I'm going to count how many males are in this room, biological males, let's be careful. How many biological males are in this room? I'm also going to count how many biological females are in this room. And I'm going to take those two numbers and write them on the board. And I'll call it, you know, biological count. Now, I could take those two numbers and find the av an average. I mean, that's like a stupid qu query to do, but you know, I could figure out the average between the two. But what it does is it takes the value, puts it in memory temporarily. And then you can operate once it's written in memory. It's not written on the disk, but it's in memory. It's a container called whatever. So in this case, what's happening is I created a container called D table for the lifetime of the query. And that's the operative term here. The lifetime of the query, this object exists in memory. Now, what does that mean technically? The second the query is done and the database server says, I have all the data that I need. It, draw, it kills that table, it releases the memory. Um, in your Java class, did Howard talk about garbage collection? <sighs> That's probably later. So essentially, a lot of languages, when you run a program, once the program terminates, it releases the memory it used, right? Bad programs don't release the memory they used. In the SQL server, the most database servers, it'll create this thing in memory temporarily. Once the query is done running, it says the program is done, whoosh, release this, it no longer exists. This is not the data you were looking for anymore. Yes. Yep. Uh, because count's a function. A count means count, count everything. I could just tell it to count the IDs. I just, I'm lazy. An asterisk is one less character than ID. Yeah, you get rid of the asterisk and you just go. And it does the exact same result. In this case, if you're doing a distinct count, it would be different. Um, so, so far it looks exactly like the same. However, here's what I can do. Now you s notice I have an alias in here that says this count is actually going to be called row count, right? When this runs, and I'm going to just run this piece, it creates a column called row count because it's been aliased to row count. For the lifetime of this query, this column is known as row count. Now, I'm passing this outside of the derived table. So what happens is it creates an object in memory with two columns. One column is now called row count. 
The other one's called customer ID. And the object's called dtable. dtable has two columns, rule count. So that means because that's how it perceives it, the outer query can refer to the aliased column names inside. So now I can actually go and say, on average, 4.74 orders per customer. It's kind of cool. It's playing with numbers, playing with math, uh, with information. Um, usually people that really get into the database really do this, develop this skill set because it's really handy. It's a really useful uh, piece of information. And as I said earlier, this behaves for all intents and purposes the same as a table. So now I can do this. Average number of orders per country. It start the, the query looks complicated, but really it's not. It's because there's a lot of text that gets overwhelming. It's a bit like when you look at a chunk of Java, and there's like 100 lines of code. Then after you slowly break it down to its component pieces, you realize it's not that complicated. The code just sucks. In this case, each piece does a job. So let me just make this all fit on one screen. Yay, it's still going. I'd hate to lose this one. Now, what it's doing is the first thing it's going to do, it's going to resolve the parentheses. And what it's going to do, it's going to resolve this subquery and create a bin in memory called dtable with two columns. Great. I'm going to calculate the average of this column. Fantastic. That was what I did the first time. However, I want to know broken down by country. Therefore, D table also has a customer ID because I'm returning that as part of the query. I'm able to join customers to the derived table because the derived table has the customer ID and I can join to customers ID. There's the first join. How do you join countries? You join the countries to customer via the country ID. And then from there, I'm able to actually write the rest of the query. It looks complex. But once you break it down, and often what I'll recommend for students to do is you actually take this and start running it piece by piece. Or take it and actually write notes next to what you think it's doing. It takes a while to understand what this does. This is a complete example of actually a fairly decent subquery. Use this derived table. It completes everything you need. It does all the bits and pieces you need. Um, it literally shows one of everything I've taught you guys so far this term. Actually, literally, it shows you one of everything I've taught you this term. It's a cute trick. Um, so yeah, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this. I'm going to go copy. I'm going to come here. I'm going to paste that. Uh, no, I'm going to say new, paste. Because I don't want to lose it. All right. So... Do you roughly understand what a derived table is? It's a subquery that's run as part of the from. It creates a temporary object in memory. You can operate on it like it's a normal table for the rest of the runtime of the query. At the end of the runtime of the query, it gets shit canned. It goes into the garbage bin. Okay. I am skipping the correlated subquery. Because, as I said, if you really want to know about them, read the booklet. I don't use them. They're not used very often, and they're really expensive to use. As in, they use up lots of memory and lots of CPU cycles. Um, and if you are trying to run one of the components by itself, like with this, I can say I want to run just this piece. It'll work. With a correlated subquery, you cannot run individual pieces. Everything has to be there. All right, brings me to my last piece, 
and that means I'm back on track content-wise. Do you guys remember set operations from high school math? Maybe? I didn't take it. So <laughs> I like asking that. My daughter took it in advanced functions. Um, and actually, when I, or there's another set of material called uh, data management, part of a math course. Some math courses you can take has sections called data management. Uh, in our case, it was known as, when I was in high school, it was part of the finite math. So for those of you that are at least, you know, 37 years old, you'll probably remember something called finite math. I don't even know something they teach now. It was an OEC, grade 13, for those that are wondering. Now, set operations means you're operating on two separate sets of data at the same time. It's not the same thing as a join. A join is creating one set of data from two sources. What the set operators do, they operate on um, two sets of data at the same time. And of course, I don't even have a slide after this. Union. Union gives you the distinct values from two different queries. I need to actually do a two-second bit of setup to actually be able to demonstrate this. Intersect gives the distinct values that exist in both queries. And except and minus gives you from one side or the other. How many of you guys remember Venn diagrams? Yay. That's not good. Okay. Allow me to demonstrate. I just need to do two seconds of prep. And the worst part of this is this is like the last part of lab eight. The only way I can demonstrate is actually doing lab eight. All right, so select email from customers. Fairly straightforward query. I can also go and it's not cooperating. Why not? Really? There. Okay, trade show leads. Congratulations. I can't type. So these are two separate queries. They look the same. They behave the same. However, now, from, email, from customers, I've got 10,001. I mean, 10,100. If I go from trade show leads, Thirteen hundred and change, thirteen hundred twenty-nine, right? So, what set operations do is it takes the data from one query and then transforms it against another query. Union means give me everything from query A plus anything unique from B. So, everything in A plus anything in B that's not in A, that's a union. And the syntax is like this. That's a hard piece of syntax. Union. Now if I run this, and I look at how many were returned, it returned 1,965. Right? So we know we have...
a grand total of 11,429, right? So 10,000 customers, roughly, 13,000 leads, roughly, gives you this number. However, if you look at what got returned, and I almost wrote on my screen with a marker, this number here is 10,964. Which tells me the following piece of math. I know I suck. I have long form subtraction, okay? <laughs> there we go. It's been a while since I did uh, grade three math, okay? 465 rows. That's the difference. That means that in customers, I have all 10,000 rows. It, in trade show leads, there's 465 email addresses that are not in customers. Therefore, it, this is giving me the clean list of all the unique email addresses from customers and trade show leads. Now, people ask me, well, why would you want to run a query like that? Okay, we have a list of customers where I work. Our customer database is close to 64,000 different email addresses. We have customers all around the world. We have in four in China. Hot damn, we finally broke into the Chinese market. We have zero in India. I don't know why. Are we find our products there. We don't sell there, though. But, you know, we have customers all around the world. Now, what's happening is we had a big trade show recently, NBM. I don't remember which one it is. I think it's the one in Florida. And we had people that came to the booths. And they swiped these little cards, right? When you go to a trade show, you got these little cards that go beep because you want more information. And they capture all the visitors that walk into your booth. And then at the end of the trade show, we pay them 5000 bucks, and they send us a list of like 26 email addresses. You know, they'll send us a list. I'm exaggerating the price, but they'll send us a list of email addresses of everyone who walked into our booth. Now, my job is to find these people that are new. Or I want to find the ones that are already in our system because maybe we might target them differently. So I will import this list of leads from the trade show into a, t a separate table in the database, and I'll run a series of queries that look like this. So I want to hit all our customers, including the ones that went to NBM, that I can return using your union. The other two operators we have is intersect. Do you guys remember what an intersect math operator is? Do you remember that in school? Intersect, don't, don't go like this. Just because you don't remember doesn't mean you're dumb, you just don't remember. Okay, intersect means where the values are the same between the two sides. So remember how I said, oh, I got 465 from here plus all 10,000? If I do the intersect, 459, right? So what does that mean? It's going to take all the ones here, compare them to all the ones in here, and tell me the ones where the email address is found in both. Therefore, technically, if I took this 1329 minus this, I should get, you know, not the same number, but a similar number. Um, but not quite. The, that's the accept, I should be saying. The intersect finds the values that are the same in both, which means if I took the 10964 plus whatever that number was, 459, it should give me this number. This one. But not fairly close. Sometimes you'll end up with weird data behaviors. But this will give me everybody who was at the trade show who is already a customer in our system. That's what an intersect does. So it takes all, this, all the data on one side, say give me everybody who matches on the other. You could do this with a subquery. You could do this with a join. No, union gives you everything from A plus anything unique from B. So it gives you all the unique email addresses. Intersect gives you the ones where they're found in both. 
Okay? So intersect matches up and tells you which ones are in both. So I have a list of 459. The last set operator is accept. Accept is actually fairly easy to understand. It says, give me everything from query A except those you find in query B. So it's going to tell me, give me everybody who didn't go to my trade show that, we, that we sell, we've sold stuff to. So now, if I run this all the way to the end, I got 9,635, which is essentially this number minus the other number. Essentially, these are all the customers in the system that did not go to the trade show. And then you send out an email to those 10,000 people saying, why didn't you come and see us at the trade show? Maybe because I'm in New Guinea and the trade show was in Florida. It's not realistic, but just saying. That's except. It'll give you everything from query A except anything it finds in query B. Now, there's a, a bit I have to explain about these set operators in a second. Once. Count it once. So it'll count all the, it'll grab everything from A that's distinct, that's distinct from A plus anything that's distinct in B that's not in A. So everything in B that's not in A that's unique. The intersect gives you everything in A that is uniquely found, also found in B. Except gives you everything from A except any that it matches in B. All right? Now, Yes, what is identical in both tables? Both queries, not tables. You got to go queries, not the tables. Because if you notice, I'm running a query and I'm only returning one column from that table. You're not comparing tables, you're comparing the contents of the table based on a query. And this is where it leads me to the complexity of set operations. This is a very simple example because I'm only dealing with one column. The problem, once you add two columns, you're adding two points of comparison. So if I've got data, and this data set doesn't lead itself to this example very well, so I'm going to just go like this. If originally I had an email, and it's d at d dot com, right? So if I did a union with just this, it would return d at d dot com. All right, I'll move over here so these guys can see it also. If I did the union on this because I'm only comparing one thing. On the other hand, I add one more column to my union. It compares all of it to each other. So then what do I end up with? d at d dot com, comma 3, d at d dot com, comma 4. Why? Because they're not the same across the entire column set. So that's where people do trip up on unions is the more columns you add, the more variation you're including that it needs to match on. Now, if you had two of these in here, at d dot com, comma three would still just return the two because these two are the same. Or actually, I should say down here, right, comma three to be more realistic. It would still go this one and this one, but this one already exists in our set. Man, my handwriting is deteriorating fast. So this, this, but this one already exists in here, therefore it's not going to get included. For every column you add, you're adding one more layer of var variation. Once you get to three or four columns, the odds are you, there's no point of using a set operation. You should probably be doing something else. That's item number one. Item number two in regards to all this is, um, I, lost my, I lost my train of thought. 
Yeah, number one is the number of columns you add. Oh, there we go. I had to rewind my conversation in my head. The other thing is you cannot do this. Two columns, one column. The number of columns has to be the same. The sets have to be similar in number of columns. So if, you, if set number one has two columns, set number two, set number three, you can do as many sets as you want. But the each must have the same number of columns. And depending on the server, and this counts for Postgres, the columns have to be the same data type. In MySQL, it doesn't care. But then again, MySQL only gives you union. It doesn't have accept or intercept. It's kind of special that way. So if your, your match is like this, if you have a varcar and an integer, and the other one's a varcar and a date, this will not work. Because they're not identical in structure. The two queries have to be identical in structure. Same number of columns, same data types, in the same order. Now there's ways of fudging it, as in if this was a var car but it all held a number, you could coerce it to an integer, as in casting. I don't know if you've heard about casting yet in Java class. Apparently I'm introducing all kinds of concepts you may not have heard of. It's when you take one data type, you force it to be something else. You can force the data types in, Postgre in the database server to become something else temporarily so that the queries work. Or even better, you could actually have this be, if you don't have a second column here and you really need to do this, you could just return the value null. Same number of columns, nulls don't have a data type. Therefore, it'll go, oh, look at this, there's nulls, that's okay. But guess what? If you had D and 1 and D and null, you get two rows back because they're different. So you're better off trying to do a set operation on as few columns as possible.